Hello, Word Workers! It is I, your Chief Word Worker, Ms. Tan, and I'm back with another research-related episode. You must have clicked this video because you are now in the process of your data gathering. Of course, no data gathering could happen without an instrument. So today, let me discuss some of the principles that may help you construct one of the most common instruments in research, the questionnaire. Today, our aim is to define what a questionnaire is and to discuss the 15 principles of questionnaire construction as discussed by Johnson and Christensen in 2014. So the questionnaire is a self-report data collection instrument that each research participant fills out as part of a research study. Depending on your research objectives, a questionnaire may focus on behavior, experiences, attitudes, opinions, beliefs and values, knowledge processes, background, and demographics. So here are the basic principles that you need to know and to follow. Principle 1. Make sure that your questionnaire items match your research objectives. Well, this is the cardinal or the fundamental principle in questionnaire construction. It is obvious that your research objectives or questions should be the one dictating what questions must appear on your instrument. So, in order to construct your questionnaire, begin with your research questions or objectives. The second principle is, understand your research participants. Since your questionnaire involves the participation and responses of your participants, it is important to think like them. Read and review your questions and ask yourself, If I were to answer or fill this instrument out, will I be able to comprehend the instructions and questions easily? Always put yourself in the shoes of your respondents and remember, what may be easy for you to understand may be difficult for them. Principle 3 is connected to this. Use natural and familiar language. Use simple and direct language that fits their level of understanding. Consider their age, educational attainment, and any cultural or social barrier that may affect their comprehension. Do not put too much jargons or technical words. However, if it cannot be avoided, then you have the responsibility to explain the meanings and the contexts to them. Principle 4 still builds on the same context. Write items that are clear, precise, and relatively short. As the researcher, you want the responses to be as authentic and as honest as possible. So if the wording of your questionnaire is problematic, then the responses will also be the same. Principle 5. Do not use leading or loaded questions. A loaded question is a question containing emotionally charged words that could elicit either a positive or a negative response. A leading question, on the other hand, is a question that suggests a certain answer. Let us take this as an example. Don't you agree that students must be given ample time to submit their schoolwork? The question itself is both a leading and a loaded question. It was phrased in a way that gives suggestion to the respondents on how to answer it. It says, don't you agree, which could be taken as either argumentative or persuasive. It somehow begs a particular response from the respondents. Moreover, the construction is too emotional. In order to improve this, a researcher may simply ask, What may be considered as ample time for students to work on their academic requirements? This way, discussions can occur and answers may be directly elicited from the respondents themselves. Principle 6 is avoid double-barreled questions. A double-barreled question is a question that combines two or more issues or attitude objects. Here is an example. Do you think that aside from their teachers, students should also seek academic help from their peers and the school counselors? As you can see, there are two attitude objects here. 
the peers, and the school counselors. Each of the objects could get a different attitude from the respondents, but this question is answerable by a yes or a no. Hence, it is quite difficult to know to which of the attitude objects a yes or a no may be attributed to. To improve this, the researcher may simply separate the two objects into two different questions. So number one, do you think that aside from their teachers, students should also seek academic help from their peers? And do you think that aside from their teachers, students should also seek academic help from the school counselors? Principle 7. Avoid double negatives. Double negative is a sentence construction that includes two negatives. Here is an example. Do you agree or disagree that students must not be given asynchronous tasks on a full face-to-face -face setup? There are two negative words here, disagree and must not be given. This is already very confusing and respondents are compelled to qualify their response because of the two negatives. In order to improve this, you may just stay on the affirmative construction. Should students be given asynchronous tasks on a full face-to-face -face setup? By eliminating the negatives, you are clearing the discussion up and the participants could easily answer with a yes or a no. Principle 8. Determine whether an open-ended or a closed-ended question is needed. An open-ended question is a question that allows participants to respond in their own words. Hence, this primarily gives qualitative data. Whereas, closed-ended question is a question that forces the participants to choose from a set of predetermined responses. Hence, quantitative data. As a researcher, you decide how you want your respondents to respond. If the parameters of your research variables are not well-defined yet, and you want to explore it using their responses, then go for open-ended questions. However, if your variables are well-defined and you only want to expose your participants to the same responses or choices, then go for a closed ended set. Now, if you choose closed-ended questions, then principle 9, use mutually exclusive and exhaustive response categories for them. Mutually exclusive response categories do not overlap. So, look at this example. 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. As you can see, Category 1, 0 to 10, overlaps with Category 2 since it also has this value of 10. The same goes to Categories 2 and 3. What is problematic about this is that a single response from your participant could also overlap between these categories. Hence, profiling may be difficult. To solve this, go for exhaustive response categories. A set of response categories is exhaustive when there is a category available for all legitimate responses. For example, in asking for the age of your respondents, you may simply put 0 to 9, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, and so on. You may also narrow down the interval between these categories. This way, the respondents could easily identify what category they belong to. Principle 10. Consider the different types of response categories available for closed-ended questionnaire items. The response categories for closed-ended questions may vary from rating scales, ranking, semantic differentials, and checklists. Using different types of responses in your questionnaire may help your respondents to stay engaged. Principle 11. Use multiple items to measure abstract constructs. Examples of abstract constructs include knowledge, awareness, and psychological stability. As the name suggests, 
These concepts may be difficult to measure as they are not tangible nor concrete. Hence, researchers should use more than one item to measure these constructs. A good example of this is the popular instrument called the Rosenberg Self-Esteem Scale. This 10-item questionnaire measures only one abstract construct, that is, the self-esteem. This way, the result is way more valid and reliable. Now, still grounded on the previous principle, Principle 12 states to consider using multiple methods when measuring abstract constructs. Taking self-esteem as an example once more, a researcher could make the participants answer the Rosenberg scale and then use another method or instrument to measure self-esteem once more. Technically, this principle speaks about the concept of triangulation. Principle 13. Use caution if you reverse the wording in some of the items to prevent response sets in multi-item scales. Reverse worded item is an item on which a lower score indicates a higher level on a construct of interest and is also called reverse scored item. Researchers use this to encourage their participants to really read each item carefully. For example, one item in a liquor type scale may be worded as Students must seek help from their school counselors regarding academic concerns. And then another item may be worded this way. School counselors must only be involved with giving the students psychological first aid and not in academic matters. So as you can see, these two items speaks of the same thing but they elicit two different responses in a scale. Principle 14. Develop a questionnaire that is properly organized and easy for the participant to use. Always consider the consequence of your questions. The most significant parts involve questions about your variables, so you have to prioritize these items in the ordering or sequencing of your instrument. And lastly, Principle 15. Always pilot test your questionnaire. Pilot test is the preliminary test of your questionnaire. It is like a rehearsal for your questionnaire to test whether it works the way it should be or not. You may want to rehearse with 5 to 10 friends or generally with people who are outside your sample population or target respondents. Ask them for feedback regarding the construction, sequencing, and other considerations that need to be accommodated in your instrument. Those are the basic principles that you need to know about before constructing your questionnaire. I hope you are able to learn a thing or two. This has been your Chief Word Worker, Ms. Tan, and I will see you again on our next episode. Enjoy your data gathering and as always, stay in school!